which will be followed by the pledges to the American flag and to the Christian flag. Ooh, if you need help with the words to the pledge to the Christian flag, you can find it in your program. <laughs> stay true to her dreams, to use her gifts wisely, and to walk the future with faith, hope, and great love. We ask these things in the precious name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. If you would please turn in your hymn books to hymn number 374. That's hymn number 374. Be Thou My Vision. It's the graduate's favorite hymn in 374. <laughs>
Robert Dotson. He will come now and give his remarks. And if you didn't know, this is the father of the graduate. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. On behalf of the faculty of Lighthouse Christian Academy and the leadership of Riverside Baptist Church, welcome to the 2020 Lighthouse Christian Academy graduation ceremony. All these years as principal and father, I never thought about what I would say when our children graduated from high school. So the other day I asked myself, how do you write a speech for a graduation? What do you, what do some of us do? We usually go to the internet and we, we start looking for examples of our speeches. I search for examples of principal graduation speeches um, to give me some type of inspiration to write a speech. I couldn't find anything which, which helped but instead, I came across a poem. That poem is on the back of the uh, program. It was of an unknown author to a daughter who was graduating. <coughs> Here's what it said. I look at you the day of your graduation, poised, ready, excited, attentive, an accomplished young lady. I know that you worked hard. I know that you are determined to succeed. And I know that your future lies stretched out before you. A blank canvas ready for you to create your own masterpiece. Your horizons are limitless. limited. The possibilities are and the challenges, while assured there, assuredly there, are ready to be faced and conquered head on. For this is how we have all come to know you throughout the years. Steadfast in your resolve to achieve your goals. Despite the obstacles, honor in your pursuit of your ideas. Kind and empathetic in your dealings with others, and above all else, to, true to yourself and your family. Our daughter, we are proud of you. We love you and, and admire you. And we stand, and we will stand, always beside you. Congratulations on your graduation day. Grace, your mother and I love you. This poem is how we feel, feel about you and your accomplishments. We know you are, are going to do great things. May the Lord continue to guide you down the path that he has for you. Again, congratulations. Yeah, that was a good speech. I didn't learn anything on the inside, however, about grace. And I thought maybe you might give us a few little pieces of information. And Grace, you were not wanting to do that, were you? <laughs> so congratulations on your graduation. On behalf of our church, I'm honored that the family has given us the privilege of having a graduation exercise. Those who graduate from homeschooling sometimes are not in a position to have a graduation ceremony. And that's why something like this is so important. And when I approached the family and said, we could do this if you would like, Grace was the first one to respond real positively. She said, I'd like to do that, June 7th. So this is it, lady, June 7th. And I'm thankful that you're here. The message I want to give tonight is more in line with a message than just a commencement speech. Now, I could give it as a commencement speech, 
And yet I'm not going to give it in a preacher mode, so to speak. But nevertheless, it's something that you and I can all profit from, found in Matthew chapter 6. Assuming that so many of you have Bibles <coughs> handy, and there are Bibles in the pews if you need one. When I read these verses, I'll read them rather rapidly. I'll not take a lot of time. But there are three things that I want to emphasize. I will tell you what I want to emphasize, I'll emphasize it, and then I'll tell you what I told you. By the way, that's what we were taught when we were in ministry school, preparing to preach the Word of God. Our professor of pulpit speech said, when you get up, tell people what you're going to tell them. Then tell them, and then tell them what you told them. He said, in other words, you're telling them something three times because it takes most people three times to get something. I don't know if that's true. But nevertheless, I want to give you a message from Matthew chapter 6 on life's biggest danger. Number two, life's chief worry. Number three, life's central problem. And all three are found beginning in chapter 6 of Matthew. And I'll read now, starting in verse 19. Lay not of yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thine whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thine whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in that way. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they so not they reap, nor get them into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Everything in life centers around trust. Whom do you trust? What do you trust? How much trust do you have? Is there anybody you can trust? So I want you to keep in mind this evening this idea of trust. Most of the time we fail to have real commitments to principles in our living. In the message in a few minutes, I will give you some commitments and I hope that you'll remember them 
for making life's decisions and determining how to make those decisions. What is important, what is not important. And that will be primarily in the point number three, which I assume you all remember. But if you don't, then I've told you what I'm going to tell you. Now I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. And then when it's all done, I'll tell you what I told you. And by then, you say, I got it. Uh, the first one. What were the other two preachers? All right. Life centers upon trust. You've got to have a guide for life. Now, most people never think about that. They enter their life like you're going to enter a different kind of life one of these days soon. And so, Grace, you're going to wonder, how will I have a guide for making decisions? You've had excellent parents to help you in principles that will guide you in making decisions. Now you've got to stay with them. All of us have access to the Word of God. And if we listen carefully, we'll find principles in this book that tell us how to live. When I went to the university years ago, I listened very carefully to a great man who was the founder. I've told our people in church this on other occasions. We met most of our classes in what was called the alumni building. It was filled with three floors of numberless classrooms, it seemed. And always when you entered the classroom, there was a big statement engraved in wood, probably about six inches high and anywhere from 10 to 20 or more feet wide over what were called in those days, what some of you have never experienced, a chalkboard. <laughs> but I assume since I've been in the alumni building in years that uh, they have at least whiteboards and now maybe there's something else and whiteboards are no longer available. But that was over all the chalkboards. So as you sat in class waiting for the professor to come, you had to be quiet for the most part. And as soon as he or she entered the room, you came to attention, at least in your seat. You were not allowed to goof off in class. You were required to pay attention. Class always started exactly on time. It ended exactly on time. But if you chose to stay a little bit after class because you didn't have an upcoming class, then there was always that sign across the chalkboard, different one in every room. One, for example, just anybody can make a living. I haven't finished it. I want you to dwell on that for a minute. Anybody can make a living. And it's true. If you're willing to seek work instead of just handouts throughout life, if you're willing to pursue any kind of a skill or a career, you can make a living. Now, it may not be the killing that you may want. That's a world expression I realize. But a lot of people don't want to just make a living. They want to make a killing. In other words, get all you can and can all you get. And in the world's way of looking at things, do unto others before they have a chance to do unto you. And you'll get ahead. That's worldly philosophy. Now, God has different principles for us. So anyone can make a living. Come. But not just anyone knows how to live. Think about it. You can make a million dollars. By the way, if you want to sit down sometime with a calculator and figure it out, how much money would you need to make per hour if you began your career of earning, shall we say, at 20 or 22, and you worked for, say, 40 years, shall we say eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, at a certain scale per hour. Now, I'm not discussing whether it rises or falls, just level it off. It's going to amaze you that most everybody who is willing to work steadily will have earned a million dollars. Well, I just don't believe that. Don't pull out your calculator now. <laughs> You're going to miss the first point and the next two points that come, and they're very important now, because I told you what I'm going to tell you, now I'm telling you what I told you I was going to tell you. So you've got to pay attention. So don't do that now. Do it later. But you'll be surprised that over a lifetime, you probably have earned in the neighborhood of a million dollars or maybe more, and you say, well, 
you can't prove it now. Here I am approaching retirement, and where's all, my, all that money gone? Well, it's, it's gone. And uh, money talks. Now, you've heard the old expression, I know money talks. It's always saying, goodbye. <laughs> and that's how money talks. I'm saying that if you could have kept every dollar that you earned, but you say, I can't do that, then don't be concerned about being a millionaire. But if you were to be able to earn far more than a million dollars in your lifetime and put a million of it away for some kind of a retirement program, just suppose. Remember, anybody can make a living. Some people go far beyond what they think they need for making a living. They have, as we say, money to burn. They uh, carry uh, more cash in their rear pocket. That's where most men carry their wallets, I guess. At least I do. Or their purses, that is for you ladies. And they don't even think about balancing the checkbook because they've always got so much money in the checkbook, they just keep writing checks. Or if you become very wealthy, then you don't even bother with the checkbook anymore. You have someone that does that for you. So if you make a lot of money, I want you to remember what I'm telling you now. This is life's biggest pleasure. And it's life's biggest danger. Going after riches. Therefore, you can earn a lot of money, but you may not know how to live. When I think of examples, and I might give you individual examples, I think of sports celebrities. I won't call them heroes, they're not heroes. They're celebrities. Hollywood is filled with celebrities. Places like Broadway in New York produce celebrities. They're all over the country. Never get your heart set on celebrities. Put your heart on Christ. Amen. Or whatever comes in life goes in life. You're not going to take it with you. So life's biggest danger is pleasure. And we think if we could hoard enough riches, we certainly could have pleasure. But a lot of those people in the sports and the entertainment industry, and that's what Hollywood and sports are basically entertainment business. You'll see that some of the biggest names have wrecked marriages, maybe multiple marriages. Some of them have spent much of their lives on booze and drugs, and it's not amounted to much. But their names were famous. It doesn't amount to anything. Because it's appointed unto men once to die. So where's all the fame? Where's well, left all behind you? Where's all the fortune? Well, it's left to nothing there. You see, people are always looking after happiness. So, Grace, I don't wish you, as you hear people say, and a lot of times they'll say it at weddings, we wish you all the happiness in the world. I don't wish you all the happiness in the world. Happiness is a state of mood, so to speak. It, it just depends on what's happening as to whether or not you're happy. It's characterized in our thinking primarily by pleasure. If things in life pleasure me, I'm happy. If they don't pleasure me, well, I'm not happy. And my goal in life is to be happy, not as a Christian. You see, the principles that you're learning and have learned from the scripture, those principles are opposed to the principles of the world. The principles of the world laugh at the principles of God. People say, that doesn't make sense. Like, give and it shall be given unto you. Oh, no, no, you, 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 you'll go broke doing that. You can't do that in life. You've got to get it, get out there and get it because you want the pleasures that life can bring. Pleasure, however, can lead you away from God because that's not a worthy goal in life. And that's life's biggest danger. The more I have in material things, the happier I will be, the more successful I will be, and whenever the problems of life come along, somehow my money will speak for me. It will solve all of my problems. It will never happen. Joy, however, is a state of mind. It's produced by the Holy Spirit of God. So you ask God to give you joy 
day by day, and you don't go after pleasure. That's life's biggest danger. This verse is so powerful, number 21. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Uh, the world says just the opposite. That's a worldly principle. But the godly principle is simply find a man's treasure and you find his heart. And the world reverses that kind of thing. Life's biggest danger, and I've repeated it about four times, pleasure. Life's chief worry all the possessions that life's greatest danger can bring me because I worry about getting them and then you got to worry about keeping them you don't want to lose any of them when those life is spent in all the material things of life how can we get more and more and more and we're never seemingly satisfied with what we already have the Bible speaks of contentment. I think a lot of Christians aren't content. Is there something wrong in having possessions, preacher? No. Nothing wrong with having possessions. But possessions cannot possess you. You may possess them. You may buy and you may dispose of what you have bought. God may allow you to have something because you've asked for it. And you ask for his will to be done. And he lets you have it. And then after a while, you begin to think, this doesn't give me the satisfaction that I thought it would. I'm going to get rid of it. I'm not bore you, but I've had those experiences. God's given me what I asked him to allow me to have. And after a while, I found that it didn't serve a good purpose in my life. So I sell it, give it away, get rid of it. But sometimes we're not able to do that because we cling so much to those material things. You see, once we get them, then we have the problem of holding on to them. Well, those things are needless, starting in verse 25. Take no thought for your life. Now, that doesn't mean that you, you go frivolously about being unsafe where you are and what's happening around you. But it simply means if you're concerned with the things that Jesus talked about in the next few verses, like food, and raiment. You'll provide food and raiment. Well, preacher, I need more than food and raiment. But God knows that. And He wants you to have more than food or raiment. Well, trust Him to supply it. Just don't make it the biggest danger of your life. Enough, always enough, so that I can have all the pleasurable things I want in life. Because then you'll have the chief worry of life, and that's possessions. Now that I've got them, I've got to keep them. You know, some people uh, amass precious things, and there's nothing wrong with having precious things. And every time my wife wants to go to Sam's with me, uh, she enjoys going to Sam's. I enjoy going to Sam's because I see kind of interesting things you're not going to see in the other Walmart store. Uh, curious things. My wife wants to go. Do you know what those people do at Sam's? The jewelry counter is right up front. You walk in the door, and you're not in there 40 feet before, and here's the jewelry counter. They used to have it a little bit farther away, but they figured it out somewhere last year, and now it's right up front. And my wife, bless her heart, I wish I could buy everything that she looks at. She doesn't really want it, if I'm sorry, she doesn't want it. But anyway, Marilyn said, uh, just, just give me a couple of minutes. She's riding one of those carts. Well, and she just goes around and around and sometimes two or three times and just moves and ozzes and all the brightest lights in the store, as you know, are right there because they want to catch your attention. Is there something wrong with that? No, not unless you uh, have to pay for it. <laughs> the chief word is possessions. God's going to provide everything that we need. Now, does he provide everything that we want? He may, he may not. That's going to be his will. Leave it up to him. Let him be in control of your life. If he wants you to have something, and you say, I would I'd really like to have it. Don't set your goal as though I'm going to get it one way or the other. If daddy can't buy it for me, then I'll just get my own credit card, and then I can get anything I want. <laughs> 
uh, a little practical advice. If you use a credit card, pay the balance due every month. That way it won't cost you a dollar. Let's go on. God provides everything because of God's providence. That means his watch care of us. So keep your life in tune with the Lord and he will provide all that you need. He'll take care of even some of the desires. The Bible says, delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. So someday if you desire a husband, you just gotta be patient and wait. And there's good advice seated on the platform there. Always check with dad and mom before you even become interested in somebody else. They're so much wiser than you are. They know how to size up people so much better than you do. So always seek the advice of dad and mom. Don't ever have the world's concept. The world's concept is when I turn 16, I can make my own decisions. I can date who I want to date. I can go and do what I want to do. And when I get to be 18, my parents can't say anything about it because my government tells me that I'm an adult. Well, if you want to believe everything the government tells you, go ahead. But if you're going to be an adult, then you're going to have respect for your parents and you will always consult your parents on decisions that you'll make in life. You're not asking them to make the decisions. You just realize they have a whole lot more experience in living than you have. Always be thankful for the possession of your parents. Life's biggest danger, pleasure. Life's chief worry, possessions. Now, life's central problem. Now, I know there are a lot of problems in life. But if I sum them up here, I think you'll understand what I'm giving you. Life's central problem begins actually in uh, verse 32 for all after all these things do the Gentiles seek for your heavenly father knoweth that you have need of all these things but that means kind of like on the other hand if you please seek ye first the kingdom of God the kingdom of God is a kingdom of righteousness is someday coming to the earth in the presence of the king himself. But the kingdom of God is a kingdom of righteousness. What's righteous? A righteous and righteousness is just right doing. That's what it means, or doing what is right. If you're a righteous person, then you do what is right. How do I know what is right? Well, that's one of the reasons God's given us the book, so that we know what is right, and we know what is wrong. The world says, we well, can't know that. Everything has to be evaluated on its own. The world says there's no real right, there's no real wrong. In other words, there's no truth and there's no falsehood. Black is white and white is black. In fact, you'll find that example in scripture. But that's the way the world thinks. And what I'm doing tonight is trying to, to get us to think like God wants us to think. And then we will avoid life's biggest danger and chief worry. The biggest danger is what? Pleasure. Good, you better, you better help me now or I'm gonna start over. <laughs> it's pleasure. Life's chief worry? Possessions. Starts with a P. Possessions. Hint, hint. Possessions. And life's central problem, and it's not problem, but it starts with a P, and I'll help you. Priorities. What is first? What takes precedence over other things? How do you make decisions? How do you determine what is first in your life or what needs to be done first? That's life's central problem. How to determine priorities. With most people, let me put it this way, I'm first. That's the attitude of most everybody. I'm first. I want to be first in line. When we were kids in elementary school, we had a couple of drinking fountains outside the building so that after recess, everybody made a mad scramble for the drinking fountains. Now we've got 40, 50 or more kids from a two or three first grade classes, second grade, third grade, didn't matter. And they're on the playground and everybody wants a drink of water before they have to go back in class. And so when we heard the first bell ring, everybody made a mad dash. I mean, we ran as fast as we could 
to the two drinking fountains. Girls, it didn't matter. If they got knocked down and stepped on, who cared? The boys wanted to drink. And if the girls pushed up and shoved us out of the way, who cared? They wanted to be first at the drinking fountain. We had a canteen. You could buy pencil and paper and notebooks and tablets and you could buy candy and little things like that at the canteen. Of course, we were told on the second and third floors, do not run down the stairs. I visited that school, it must have been about, um, I don't know, five years ago. It's no longer a school, but yet the building is still there and the name is still on it. It was built in 1926, that was not the year I was born. <laughs> but nevertheless, <laughs> my father attended school there and my grandfather, they have attended for a while, but not in that particular building, but under the same school name in another building. And so the building was still there. And the building was just like I pictured it on the inside. Block walls, concrete steps. All three floors, concrete steps. And I'm telling you, we guys, we could take one leap halfway down, one more leap, and we're all the way down. The girls could just about do the same thing. And when the time came for canteen, we were, saying, we were told, you will not run in the hallways. Now, if a teacher caught you running in the hallway, then you'd stay up to school about 30 or 40 minutes. But if she didn't catch you, and, and of course, you're invincible, you're never gonna be caught. You're not gonna get caught. Were you ever caught? Let's go on here. <laughs> uh, yes, everybody made, again, this mad dash to the canteen. Why? Because you gotta get in line. And there's the pushing and the shoving to get in line. Priorities. Priorities say, I am priority. And there's none beside me. I stand alone. I am priority. What that amounts to is the worship of self. When you grow up with that kind of an attitude, if it's not taken out of you before you reach adulthood, you're in for some real problems in life. So with all respect, Grace, you're not priority in life. You are now. You are right now priority. And when we leave in a few minutes, you're going to leave the procession now. It's your night and it should be. But don't let the world fool you by saying you need to be number one. If you're not number one, nobody pays attention to you. Nobody cares about you. You gotta get out there and get what you want in this whole life. Priorities are important. I'll list some as early as I can. God's Word. Priority. You want to know how to live? I told you tonight truth from the old book. Briefly, how to live. That's priority. Number two, God's Son is priority. Now you'll get your priorities straightened up with God's Son through God's Son's Word. That's how you know who is priority in your life. Would this that I'm entering into, that I want, be pleasing unto him? Could I honor him somehow with it? If it's something recreational you'd like to have, there's nothing wrong with having that. But it doesn't dominate you. The only thing, and I use this word carefully now, the only thing that should dominate you in life is this book and the principles that this book gives you. Let those things dominate you. Family. Family comes next. Other people <coughs> fit into your life. And you go through life not reaching out for another selfie, selfie, selfie somewhere, as though I'm the most important person on the universe. Learn to establish good, godly, safe priorities. Now some scripture. When a preacher closes his Bible, it may mean something, and it may not. <laughs> Listen to Scripture. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in Him, and it shall bring it to pass. That's Psalm 37, 5. From the 55th Psalm, verse number 22. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and He shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. From Proverbs 16, 3. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. From 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. 
Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all of your care upon him, for he careth for you. Life's biggest danger, pleasure. Life's chief worry, possessions. Life's central problem, priorities. Diploma reads, Lighthouse Christian Academy, Satellite Beach, Florida. This certifies that Grace Elizabeth Dotson has satisfactorily completed the necessary requirements of study as prescribed by high or by school administrators, and is thereby presented with this high school diploma, and is entitled to all the rights and privileges pertaining thereof. Dated six this day, sixth day of June, twenty twenty. for joining us this evening. These roses are from my parents, um, for providing for the education to the fifth graders. Hopefully you need that. This is a band, and that Bible can never be here again. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dad, I want to thank you for making these roses for us to be in school. If it weren't for you and Mom, I'd probably not be standing here tonight. And Mom, I want to thank you for teaching me and being there for me. I think you're the hope of God, too. Good <laughs> 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 I want to thank Pastor and Pastor Susan for allowing me to have that faith and being able to carry on this faith with me. I was saved at the age of seven at um, Heavenly Baptist Church in Great Falls, Montana. Um, the big truth teacher was there preaching about hell and how Christ had died to pay for my sins. He then closed the service and asked if there was anybody who wanted to trust Christ as a personal savior. I raised my hand and asked him, how could I be saved? He then showed me from the Bible how God had paid for our sins, that we were sinners, and that if I did not trust him as my personal savior, I would die in hell without him. I then trusted Christ as my savior, and since then, I know that I'm one of Amen. Um, I want to serve God. And I believe he has called me to be a medical missionary, whether here in the States or in another country. Um, he has given me the opportunity to go to Myanmar in November to learn from other medical school missionaries. And uh, hopefully, Lord willing, in the fall of 2021, I will be going to Pensacola Christian College for nursing. Um, please pray for me as I continue on this journey. Amen. Lord, 
just ask you to just continue to have your hand upon her, Lord, and just uh, continue to guide her, Lord. Lord, I just ask you to just be with all of us as we head over, Lord. As she just bless the food, bless the bodies, Lord. Lord, just uh, be with us as we go. Amen.